Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. My name is Mona Yakubian. I'm a senior advisor with the Middle East and Africa Center at USIP, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this very important discussion on the World Bank's recent publication, The Fallout of War, Consequences of the Conflict in Syria. Uh, uh, this publication, th th this, we join, we start our discussion today noting that the conflict in Syria is soon to enter its second decade. This has been a conflict of enormous consequence. Uh, it has provoked the greatest humanitarian crisis since the end of World War II. It's had an incredible impact on Syria's neighbors, in particular on Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. For some time, the World Bank has endeavored to understand the conflict in Syria in all of its complexity. Starting in 2017, the World Bank published The Toll of War, which looked at the conflict and its impact inside Syria. It's also looked at the impact on displacement. And with this third publication, it's looking at the consequences for Syria's neighbors, uh, those that have been in particular disproportionately affected, as I noted, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and Iraq. We are very lucky to have today uh, the, a panel, very distinguished panel, who will be looking more deeply at both the analysis in the report and also I think a very hopeful note that the report offers, which is a way forward. It, it seeks to propose a medium term outlook and one that takes a regional approach. So before I introduce our panel today, what I'd like to do is just offer a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we very much want your participation in today's event. You can tweet about the event using the hashtag Syria Fallout. And importantly, we ask that you please participate by asking questions using the chat box. If you're using the USIP page, the chat box is just below the video player. Otherwise, you can submit your questions uh, through YouTube or Twitter. Uh, you can find a link to the report that we're discussing in the chat box uh, on the USIP page. So let me now begin by introducing very briefly the speakers in the order in which they're going to speak. Saroj Kumar Jha is the Regional Director for the Mashrek Department of the World Bank. He brings vast experience, having served in several other positions at the bank, including previously a senior director for fragility, conflicts, and violence, and the violence global practice at the bank. He joins us today from Beirut, Lebanon, where he's based. Harun Ander is a senior economist at the World Bank. He is also the lead author of the report that we're going to be discussing. His work at the bank has focused on the economics of conflict and forced displacement, international trade policy, the economic implications of demographic transitions and challenges faced by natural resource rich economies. Natasha Hall is a senior fellow with the Middle East program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where her work focuses on aid, civilian protection and governance and conflict issues with a particular focus on the countries that are covered in, in the World Bank report. And finally, Rhonda Sleem is senior fellow and Director for, of Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogues at the Middle East Institute. Rhonda is a long-term practitioner of Track 2 Dialogue and peacebuilding processes in the Middle East and Central Asia. She has undertaken extensive work on Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. Uh, let me, before we begin, I just want to thank uh, our colleagues at the World Bank, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and at the Middle East Institute. This is really a collaborative effort among all of us. And this discussion will kick off a deeper dive that we will all take together in collaboration, looking more deeply at the issues presented in the report. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Saroj, first. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mona. And I want to begin by thanking uh, US Institute of Peace for hosting all of us today for a very important conversation. But I also want to thank uh, CSIS and the Middle East Institute for 
this collaborative effort to take the messages from this report to a wider discussion and see how we can uh, use this to inform various international efforts ongoing to bring peace and stability in the Middle East. When, uh, when we did this Tola War report in 2017, which you referred to Mona, this was essentially to do an economic and social impact of the conflict inside Syria. And this report had several very important messages. One of the key message was that the total economic uh, losses in the country was at least 20 times more than the physical destruction that was uh, visible to us, which essentially meant that more than the physical destruction, the conflict had much deeper and severe impact on the social and economic fabric of the country. Starting from there, when we started to engage various stakeholders engaged in the peace process, in the humanitarian efforts, in the various research groups across the world, we found out that there is a need for us to continue understanding uh, much more what has really happened as a result of the conflict, not only inside Syria, but other countries in the region. And starting from there, we established a Syria analytical roadmap which was essentially to bring the knowledge gap that was out there in the context of the Syrian conflict and how we can establish a more systematic program of research, bringing World Bank Group's technical and economic expertise in understanding these issues. And the report that we are discussing today is one of those uh, products as part of the Syria analytical roadmap. And I do want to thank all our partners who have provided uh, various technical and financial contribution to us to be able to produce this report. My second point is about the region. So we live in a region right now where there is a perfect storm. Syrian crisis is one of the many crises that the countries in the region are experiencing. There's a much bigger fiscal crisis in our group of countries. You have countries experiencing severe financial and banking crisis. And then, of course, on top of this, you have the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted all the countries very badly. And this has essentially created a major challenge for institutions like us, a development institution as to how can development contribute to peace, stability and resilience in a region like this. And our work continues to be informed by three, three broad considerations, as I just mentioned. How do we help people and the institutions in our countries in this region in order to use development tools in a manner that it creates more peace building environment, it creates more stability, and it gives opportunity to those who have the, uh, who have the entrepreneurship qualities, who have the the, the drive to really push forward with innovations, whether they are in remote parts of Iraq or Jordan or Lebanon. In doing all this, we're trying to ensure certain principles, what I describe as three core principles, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. Because that is essentially going to drive how we can see the development impact of our interventions, not just the World Bank, but all the partners we work with in this region. As you mentioned, rightly mentioned, Muna, that the, this report was not just about understanding how the Syrian conflict has impacted Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq, but also to see what the future might look like, how this would evolve, and, uh, and what are the opportunities on a national and an international and the regional level, essentially, to really promote more stability, more prosperity in the region. I think that is where this report tries to uh, provide some uh, ideas, some uh, initial suggestions that would need, of course, more discussion in the broader space. Now, apart from the report, I just want to conclude by saying that uh, we are very actively engaged in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, the three countries which have been studied in the report. Uh, we continue to provide technical and financial support to these countries. We, in, we provide concessional financing so that the refugees and the host communities are have access to good health, good education services, as well as livelihood opportunities for the people uh, in these countries. And we will continue to do so 
as the peace process goes forward. But once again, I want to thank you again, uh, Mona, for uh, bringing us all together and to USIP for hosting this very important event. Back to you, Mona. Thanks so much, Saroj. That was a really helpful framing. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Haroon. And Haroon's going to walk us through in much more detail uh, the key findings of the report. So Haroon, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mona. Thank you, colleagues, uh, to be here today. Let me quickly share my screen. All right. Uh, Mona, can you confirm that it's, it's visible? It is indeed visible. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as Saroj mentioned, uh, this is a, a product that has been uh, supported by many partners, including the governments of Canada, Netherlands, Germany, United States, and UK, as well as our participation with uh, uh, collaboration with UNHCR. Uh, uh, as, as previously mentioned, this is part of a three report series. The first one is the Toll of War 2017. The second one is the Mobility of Displaced Syrians, 2019, and this is the third report, in, which was released in June 2020. And the first report very briefly looked at the economic and social impact inside Syria and took a stock of the outcomes that are associated with conflict and tried to understand how we can explain these uh, outcomes. The second report we looked at the return patterns of Syrian refugees. Obviously, we found that the security conditions inside Syria, including broad human rights and property rights, uh, derived the returns. But the conditions in host countries have uh, very complex influences on return patterns. For example, the typical uh, logic that if the refugees face uh, bad conditions in host countries, they'll go back. We found no evidence for that. In fact, in certain cases, it was the opposite. If refugees faced better conditions, they were more likely to return because they could afford to return a risky return journey. Uh, this report, I'm skipping quickly, uh, this report focuses on three major buckets here. The first one is that we take a stock of the conflict-driven outcomes in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq. We look at economic growth, labor markets, uh, fiscal side, environmental side, and many other uh, dimensions. And the second bucket is we look at the, we try to make sense of these outcomes, how through which channels uh, conflict affected the economic growth in neighboring countries. We look at trade, refugee, and total factor productivity. And finally, we take a step back and we look forward. We ask the question, what can be done at this point? And we classify our, our uh, policy recommendations in two groups. One is the unilateral policies, that is the policies that can be pursued by individual countries, regardless of what happens elsewhere in the region. And the second one is what can we do jointly, all countries together in the region. And that's what we call a regional approaches. Uh, so the report is quite extensive, more than 200 pages. In this presentation, I will focus on only the 10 key messages, really. And three of these messages will be about how the impact has taken place so far. The other three will be about the prior co previous conditions that enabled that facilitated such an impact. And the final four slides or messages will be about the way ahead. OK. so. Let's start with the GDP growth. Uh, when we compare the last two decades in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, that is uh, between 2000 and 2010, and after 2010 until 2018, where we had the latest data at the time of preparation, what we see is that the, on average, the GDP in Lebanon shrank by about 4.2% GDP growth uh, shrank by 4.2% between the two decades. And in Jordan, this was about 3.9 uh, percentage points. Uh, is this all about the Syrian conflict? Not really, because there were global and regional factors that uh, could facilitate such a slowdown. For example, the global financial crisis in 2018, 
as well as uh, oil price dynamics or other regional factors, for example, non-Syria related Arab Spring events could all slow down the economic growth in these countries. So how do we know how much of that slowdown comes from the Syrian conflict? So to be able to assess that, we really need a counterfactual case, which means that take Lebanon, for example, uh, we would need a Lebanon elsewhere in the world that looks exactly like the Lebanon that we know, but it was not exposed to the Syrian conflict. And as we all know, we don't have such a case. We don't, uh, we don't have a, a, a different Lebanon that wasn't exposed to Syrian conflict. But what we did is that we followed a statistical approach called synthetic control method. This combines the characteristics of all other countries, the relevant countries, and create a synthetic, a fictitious Lebanon elsewhere. And we observe its pattern, compare with the actual Lebanon's pattern uh, to assess what would be the counterfactual. And what we see is that the, the Syrian conflict indeed slowed down the economic growth in Lebanon by 1.7 percentage points, and in Jordan by 1.6 percentage points, in Iraq by 1.2 percentage points. So that is the part that the Syrian conflict is directly responsible for. Okay, how do we explain this uh, slowdown? Uh, how did the Syrian conflict translate into a GDP growth slowdown in neighboring countries? We, we performed the decomposition exercise. We looked at, as I mentioned, trade, the refugee arrivals and total factor productivity. What we found was that if everything else was the same, but the trade shock did not happen, did not take place, the Jordanian GDP would grow by about 3.1 percentage points faster, and Lebanese GDP would grow by about 2.9 percentage points faster if the trade shock did not happen. So by these numbers tell us already that a large portion of the GDP impact uh, associated with the Syrian conflict is trade related. How about refugees? Well, we find that Refugees actually increased the GDPs in Lebanon and Jordan by 0.9 percentage points for a very simple reason. When you have more people, you have more consumers, so there's more consumption. Also, you have more workers, there is more labor market activity. So the aggregate economic activity increases when you have more people, controlling for all other factors. However, the GDP effect and, and the aggregate economic activity effect on the aggregate economic activity is only a small portion of the story here. When we look at the poverty, for example, we see that the poverty, uh, the same directly increased the poverty rates in Lebanon by 7.1 percentage points, and in Jordan by 3.9 percentage points, and in Iraq by 6 percentage points. Uh, in Lebanon, this is, uh, a bit, there's a bias, for example, the female households, female headed households experienced uh, worse conditions. Whereas in Jordan and Iraq, we observe that the rural households observe a bit uh, worse conditions in this case. Uh, further, we also observe that there is in the publicly provided goods and services, there is congestion effects. Uh, a certain amount of publicly delivered services is shared by a greater number of people because of the refugee arrivals. And this is particularly uh, relevant in health healthcare and transportation sectors. There's also a fiscal implication of this. Even if the refugees pay their electricity bills or the international community fully covers the electricity bill, this still has fiscal implication for host countries because the elec electricity fees are subsidized. And in Lebanon, this amounts to about $130 million per year, uh, this subsidies that goes to the refugees, even if they fully pay their uh, bills. And in Jordan, it was estimated to be between 60 and $100 million. On the environmental side, we observe that there is definitely higher municipal solid waste generation because of refugee arrivals. We see some water pollution effects, but these are very localized. It's not general, it's not everywhere, it's only in certain locations. And I would like to emphasize that uh, even with such a comprehensive looking at uh, different sectors, we still are unable to cover the entire complexity of the effect. There are multiple different issues, for example, the political effects, the security related effects, 
effects, cultural effects. These we, we couldn't cover in this study, either because we don't have the relevant metric or we don't have the relevant data to analyze this issue. In the labor markets, this is one of the important areas, we observe that uh, there is in general a deterioration in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon uh, over the last uh, decade or so. And this is particularly uh, problematic for uh, females. When you look at Iraq unemployment rate, it increased for 16% to 38% for females in Iraq. And in Jordan, it increased from 18% to 30%. But even these numbers do not uh, do justice to the severity of the problem. In Iraq, for example, uh, in conflict affected areas, let's say Kirkuk, there was about 25% uh, female employment before the onset of the conflict. And this was pretty much wiped out. It decreased to about 5% only by the end of the uh, conflict. Um, is there a correlation between refugee presence and worse labor market outcomes in uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq? We do not observe such correlations. When we look at the data, we see that this graph here shows you the, the share of forcibly displaced local population in local population. And on the vertical axis, you see the labor market performance. What we observe in Jordan is that those places where there are more refugees, performed better in terms of labor market activity over the last decade compared to other places where there weren't many refugees. In Iraq, there is some positive correlation, but the problem there is we cannot separate the refugee effect from the conflict, overall the presence of the conflict effect. Most refugees are in locations where there were also significant clashes with ISIS, so these are difficult to uh, disentangle. So what we conclude from this, looking at the Jordan data, is that yes, there is labor market deterioration, but this is about the broader effects of the Syrian conflict rather than refugee presence. So when we look at uh, these effects in Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq, we compare this with other global cases, other continents, other, other years. And what we found is that the impact on especially Lebanon and Jordan has been quite large compared to other conflict situations. And next, we ask the question why these countries were affected so badly. And we have three possible explanations. One is that the Syrian conflict was very brutal and very long. That's correct. And the second one is the exposure to the Syrian conflict was high in neighboring countries. And then the third one is the institutional resilience was low. Just to use an analogy, take the Pisa Tower in Italy, we know that over time it lists further to the side. There will be a point where even a slightest breeze might lead to a collapse of the tower. So how do we assign the causality in this case? Can we say that just a really very pleasant breeze led to a collapse of the tower? Or are we going to blame only the structural uh, integrity problems? Well, the right answer is probably both. So there is an external shock. Yes, we need to attribute that one, the, the proper role, but also the structural problems, and that's what we do here. Um, when we look at the exposure side, uh, I mentioned that trade is an important part of the, the story. But when you look at the bilateral trade between Syria and its neighbors, actually the bilateral merchandise trade between Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Syria were quite low for Lebanese and Jordanian exports. But what mattered was the, the services. For example, in Lebanon uh, in 2010, the services constituted about 42% of the GDP. And when you look at the previous decade, it, those services were growing by 8% per year. But that growth decreased to a negative 1% in the current decade. So that explains half of the GDP was Growing at 8% previous decade, now it's shrinking by 1%. It explains the, the economic dynamics there. Similarly, in Jordan, the services and merchandise exports were of equal size, 22-23%, but they were growing about 19% in the previous decade and 7%, which decreased to 3% growth in the current decade. So that explains uh, what's going on in the trade side. Also, these economies were heavily reliant on FDI inflows in the previous decade. 
all of these, the services, which are largely tourism and FDI inflows are very sensitive to regional instability. And that's what we observe. In terms of the institutional resilience, what we see is that uh, Iraq had one of the lowest state capacities in the world in 2010 for obvious reasons. Jordan had one of the best in MENA, but its fiscal space was narrowing very quickly because of the wrong fiscal policies. The revenues were about 33% uh, of GDP in 2005. It decreased to about 25% in 2010 because of largely the exemptions and other factors. In Lebanon, the problems, Lebanon had problems like combined, combined problems of Iraq and problems of Jordan. So they faced both problems. Its state capacity suffered from years of underinvestment and it had a large debt burden which suffocated fiscal space. For example, when you look at the interest payments in Lebanon in 2005 and 2010, it was about 10% of GDP. That is largely about half the entire government's budget. And in many years, the interest payment, the debt, the interest payments on outstanding debt was the largest expenditure item in government's budget, exceeding the wage bill of the government. So imagine that situation, quite, quite uh, troublesome. And at that point, I remember my discussions with colleagues and Lebanon was described as, as a country that defies gravity because of this problem. Uh, unfortunately, the recent events uh, show that, that that was an illusion. Uh, no country defies gravity in the long term. So together with the, the size of the exposure and then the resilience problems, we arrive at a situation where we call a low equilibrium, which is combined or aggravated by an agency problem. And by agency problem, I mean that this vicious circle here, the domestic politic political economy constraints in these countries prevented a more structural response to the Syrian conflict's impact on these countries. Uh, the governments in this, uh, especially Lebanon and to a certain extent in Jordan, took a rather short-termist approach, providing uh, quick and dirty fixes for what became to be a, a structural issue in these countries. And that short-termism, in return, fed into an international short-termism. And by that, what I mean is that because the, the governments in these countries could not commit to a structural solution, the international community also took a short-termist perspective. They also couldn't commit to a more structural assistance framework for these countries. The assistance provided uh, has been largely project by project and year by year without a commitment to a medium-term framework. But because the international community couldn't commit, that also reinforced the short-termism in, in domestic policies. So we have two short-termism that feed into each other, and the result is a very ineffective situation. Uh, the service provision is ineffective. For example, when you think about the, the water provision to refugees, a large reliance on tracking water, which is three times more expensive than regular approach, and then there is a problem of lost economic opportunities. Refugees on average get 5.4 years less education than Lebanese, 3.7 years less education than Jordanians. And if, if we were to close this gap, the GDPs would increase by 1.1% and 0.4% in Lebanon and Jordan. And finally, a lot, many of the program, programs in these countries are underfunded because of the because the donors divert their money to areas where the bang for the buck is greatest. Okay, so that's where we stand. The, going forward, the bad news is that the situation is unlikely to improve because of a change in Syria. We ran simulations about uh, recovery and reconstruction inside Syria. And in all three possible scenarios, the GDP impact of a possible economic recovery uh, inside Syria for Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq is less than one percentage points. And one of the reasons for that is because for example, take the reconstruction perspective, many of the materials that would be needed for reconstruction inside Syria, the neighbors are themselves net importers, so they don't produce those things. 
Uh, the good thing is that there are things to be done. Even in the current political economy scenario, where the effective responses are suffocated by the political economy constraints, there are things that can be done. And we identified three areas. Uh, first, enhancing social safety nets. Second, improving service access for all. And third, investing in state capacity. In all these three areas, there are synergies that can be pursued between the national systems and the refugee assistance programs. And if these synergies are pursued, we believe that the political economy constraints will not bind because these things are win-win uh, scenarios. So it can be, there is something in it for everyone in these countries. But obviously this approach uh, only has limited applicability in a way that uh, it won't transform everything under the sun overnight. But what we propose in terms of the second group of policy, act policy actions is a regional perspective. The unilateral perspective can be pursued under current political economy constraints, but we believe that taking a more regional perspective, both countries themselves and the international community, can relax some of these political economy constraints. And there are uh, three major areas where we observe there are clear gains from a regional economic perspective. One is energy, the second one is transportation, and the other one is the ICT technologies. There are large gains to try to relax this country, country by country approach and short term approach and take a more medium term regional perspective. Um, but as many of you would know, the region has a long history of regional integration efforts, and many of them didn't succeed so far. And there are reasons, the same political economic constraints that affect, uh, that prevent effective responses could also prevent such a regional perspective. But what we think is that we are in a special situation now, looking at the region's long history, we think that there are opportunities to be pursued. For example, the demographic shocks, the refugee presence, if this, this problem is approached the right way, it could provide an uh, opportunity to improve cross-border economic relationships. Similarly, the external markets. If we have better access to external markets, be it the European Union or the regional uh, markets, this could facilitate a better uh, bottom-up uh, regional integration framework. And while we do that, it's important to, to pursue a balance between competition across the countries and cooperation. And all these three messages come from the long history of the region where we looked at the centuries before what has happened. Okay, so let me stop there and uh, just provide uh, the concluding remarks. What we see in this report is that the shock that the, this region experienced is, is severe. It could destabilize even the advanced countries in the world. And we know that the Syrian conflict played an important role in this outcome, but it's not the only factor. The region had preconditions and the Syrian conflict aggravated these preconditions. And going forward, we believe that uh, we need to transform our approach to a more medium-term perspective, which incorporates the cross-border uh, externalities in this region. And we believe that it is very difficult to stabilize only single country in the region. The region as a whole, we need to take this problem and incorporate the cross-border interlinkages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haroon. That was a really very rich presentation. Uh, before I turn to our two discussants, first we'll hear from Natasha and then from Rhonda, I want to remind the audience that you are encouraged to submit questions using the chat box on the USIP webpage just below the, the video player. Um, so Natasha, let's, let's turn to you next for some brief comments on, uh, on what you've heard. Great, thank you, Mona, uh, for the introduction. And thanks to USIP for having me. And of course, a big thanks to Haroon and, and the World Bank team for this really excellent report. It's quite a feat of data analysis and I, I recommend that everyone tries to read it in its entirety. Uh, more personally, as someone who spent the bulk of my career working in and on the countries mentioned in the report, 
I'm really glad that you're shining a light on Syria's neighbors, uh, which have borne the brunt of the crisis, and uh, especially at a time when we're facing an economic downturn due to the pandemic and also donor fatigue. I should mention, in addition to the, the figures that Haroon just mentioned, the IMF now expects GDP in the Middle East to de uh, decrease by 4.7%. And remittances by 20. So there's no doubt that these countries, especially Jordan and Lebanon, have taken on quite a Herculean task. Um, I'm also pleased to see the recommendations for longer term or medium term solutions, uh, as well as the need for greater institutional resilience. Uh, and just briefly on the need for longer term solutions in case anyone needed more convincing. I just want to remind everyone that UNHCR estimates that refugees today are displaced on average between 17 to 25 years. And in the case of Syrians in particular, as the previous World Bank report pointed out, also authored by Haroon, there's little hope for unmasked return due to security conditions. And I should mention that these security conditions are not just about shelling and active conflict, but they're also regarding arbitrary arrests and a general feeling of being unsafe. Uh, in fact, there was a recent study by a Syrian organization that found that more than 60% of refugees who had returned to Syria, which I should mention is a very small slice of, of the millions of refugees that have fleed, uh, were already actively seeking a way to flee again due to these security conditions. So with that in mind, I just want to focus uh, my brief remarks on a couple of points, uh, one of which was featured prominently in the report, which was the need for institutional resilience. And the second point, which was not mentioned, but it's really vital to ensuring any kind of medium term solution works. And that's enshrining the basic rights of refugees. And then I'll just conclude with a request to the, to the donor and loaner communities. But in terms of, of institutional resilience, Haroon mentioned and the report mentions uh, the need for transparency and accountability. But I really wanna highlight this as a priority. Um, because one thing that I can affirmatively say and that the report also says that a lot of these problems um, existed prior to the Syrian conflict, but may have been exacerbated. At CSIS, we've actually been assessing governance through several sectors, such as water and waste management and the power sector, uh, particularly in Lebanon and Jordan. And in the past, over a decade ago, I worked on the ground evaluating Iraq reconstruction efforts. And I can tell you that in Iraq, I saw horror stories of hospitals being built with hallways that couldn't fit a gurney. And now we know that an estimated $320 billion has been stolen since 2003. And there are real fatal consequences to this kind of corruption and mismanagement. In 2018, we saw tens of thousands of people in Southern Iraq hospitalized due to what was likely contaminated water. And now we see the underfunded health system is overwhelmed by COVID. On the other hand, in Lebanon, you see wastewater treatment plants that aren't connected to sewage systems and sewage systems not connected to treatment plants. Uh, we saw the outcome of these institutional failures most prominently with the garbage crisis in Lebanon and the absolutely horrible explosion in Beirut a month ago. I, I know it's hard when we're constantly putting out fires, literally and figuratively in the region, to sort of stop and put more energy into monitoring and evaluation and better understanding the roles of vested interests and political dynamics. But this is really vital for doing more with limited resources, and there's always going to be limited resources, uh, and also for encouraging investment to decrease dependence on aid and, and loans in the long term. So the second point, which has been a politically thorny issue in the region for generations, um, but I was happy to see that the report sort of indirectly quantified the economic benefits of enshrining the rights of refugees in these countries. Uh, the report points out that less than half of Syrian school aged children are not going to school uh, in the neighboring countries. Uh, but the human capital gain from closing these educational gaps is quite substantial. As Rune mentioned, 1.1% in Lebanon and 0.4% in Jordan. But in order to make these gains, Refugee children don't just need the right to work, uh, which they have, uh, <laughs> the right to education, sorry, which they have in the region, but their parents need the right to work and they need the right to work free of exploitation and legal barriers. Because if refugees don't have the right to work, families uh, are more likely to send their children to work thinking that they won't be punished. And at the same time, if families don't feel like they have a future in different sectors, especially skilled sectors, they're less likely to see a need for education. 
Now, assuming these rights are enshrined uh, by law and the right policies are in place for accountable and sustainable service provision, uh, there needs to be an independent regulator with a strong mandate to enforce laws for each of these points. Plans and, and laws are, are wonderful, but without a regulator, they'll just be words on paper and spending is not going to equal performance. So I'll just conclude by saying that additional funds to respond to the economic and social consequences of the fallout are absolutely necessary. And they've been a great opportunity to build institutional resilience. I mean, in Jordan, in Northern Jordan in particular, we have sanitary landfills now where previously there had been none. And that was in part to respond to the refugee influx. But we also need to develop better understandings of local political realities and vested interests to better combat the impediments to sustainability and institutional resilience. Because I fear when people's basic needs aren't met, even though billions have been spent and their basic rights are not being protected, it's going to lead to more protests and more instability and conflict, which as the report very clearly outlines, uh, has, has negative ripple effects. And it will also affect the possibility for regional integration, but I'll leave, I'll leave Rhonda to, to speak on that a bit more. Thank you again. Terrific, Natasha, thanks so much for those very helpful comments. Um, Rhonda, let's turn to you uh, and hear your thoughts on the, on the report. Am I on now? Yeah. You are on. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone who is participating in this panel. Uh, thank you, Mona and USIP for inviting me today. And it's uh, really an honor to share the virtual podium with Saroj, Harun, Natasha, and, and um, you, Mona. Uh, let me start by commending Saroj and Harun for yet another comprehensive report addressing the socioeconomic impact of the Syrian conflict, building on the two previous reports, which you have done focused on the impact of the conflict on the Syrians themselves, and then on their decision and, and the, the mobility calculus of a refugee. I think this trilogy, the Syrian trilogy that the World Bank has, uh, has, has provided, uh, provides a much needed evidence-based data-driven narrative of the impact of the conflict us, uh, on Syria, the region, and its people. And the added value of this report, uh, which is something that Harun uh, mentioned in his presentation, is to isolate the socioeconomic impact of the conflict in Syria on the three host uh, countries. While, as Harun said, there is a net negative impact of the conflict in Syria, the report argues and present evidence that other things being equal in the absence of refugees, the Lebanese and Jordanian GDP would have grown on average 0.9 percentage points more slowly between 2011 and 2018. And the impact of the refugees on growth in Iraq was positive but modest, about 0.1 percentage point. Um, busting, I mean, there has been this myth um, uh, in the region, uh, which has been inflated by, uh, by officials in some countries about uh, blaming the refugees uh, for all the ills that have befallen the country since 2010. And I think this report with the data, with the evidence that it provides, uh, you know, creates a, a, an important, uh, how to say, uh, uh, framing and, and context uh, uh, for uh, that, for this impact. And in, in that, and in doing so, provides uh, needed guidelines for how uh, to proceed uh, forward. So if I may add um, another uh, role to the World Bank in your mission statement, that of myth buster. So um, uh, let me now um, uh, move to three points I would like to make about the report quickly. The first report is has to do with how much shorter is short short-termism, which is well identified as being a problem in dealing with the, with the, 
with uh, in dealing more effectively and productively with uh, with the impact of the of the conflict in these countries how the short term short termism in both the host countries and the don donor community is driven by this assumption which has been now in place and you know promoted by uh, the international community countries and international bodies that a solution to the syrian conflict along the lines of unscr 2254 is reachable i mean that's uh, we continuously hear from uh, from uh, donor uh, countries from official in these donor countries that they are committed to a lasting political solution that's syrian owned and syrian led along the line of the un security council resolution 2254 whereas if we look at the conflict dynamics in syria in fact there is not much hope for a syrian owned syrian led lasting political solution political solution. To the contrary, the conflict in Syria is becoming more complex, less Syrian-owned, population displacement continues, while the security and economic condition in Syria are now, and will rightly remain, major obstacles to the return of refugees. Absent major geopolitical shifts, a best-case scenario in Syria is a no war, no peace scenario. This means that the current cost-benefit calculus at the elite level about short termism in the countries that you that you that are mentioned in this report but as well as in the donor community that has an interest in maintaining the capacity of these countries to continue to host uh, these uh, these community the cost benefit calculus about short termism is not is not likely to change and in that respect and, and create another challenge uh for 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 moving toward the more efficient uh, uh the more economically savvy if we can put it uh, this way regional approach that uh, uh that that is being argued uh in this uh, report uh still i mean uh, uh, so 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 the the challenge is is going to be again is how to, in the absence of this kind of resolution of the conflict that is sustainable, that is uh, that is, that meets the criteria that set forth by the international community, uh, how can you move to this regional approach that you are uh, that you are mentioning? What are the incentives, you know, that 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 could be offered, you know? to the uh, regional actor, but also to the donor community, which is going to be called upon, especially in the days of COVID, uh, uh, to continue to focus on the short-term humanitarian assistance that countries will need, not only to deal with the toll from the refugee influx, but also to deal with the economic condition and health challenges which COVID have brought to the surface. Which brings me to my second point, having to do with how the international community can do work differently and it's something and and that deals because as you well identify the problem is not only short termism is not only with the countries themselves with the host communities host countries but also it's with the way the international community the donor community does its work and lebanon in this case provide us a unique opportunity to really for the international community to test a different approach and uh, given the multiple crises that it is facing uh, given the this international push, the concerted effort that you are all mentioning in the report uh, for, uh, for, for Lebanon to engage in serious economic reforms, especially after the uh, blast, uh, the port blast. Um, is there a different, how can the international community do work differently and present or put in place an improved model of distributing aid that looks for the long term, but at the same time bypass the Lebanese corruption, the, the challenge which uh, Natasha talked about, not only in Lebanon, but also in other uh, countries. Usually outside countries would set up a multi-donor trust fund in cooperation with the host nation, but given the justified lack of public confidence in Lebanon's political and business class, donor countries such as the United States, GCC and the EU should aim to establish an international reconstruction authority that is more removed from Lebanese jurisdiction. The donor should frame the authority as a compact, an agreement that offers bil Lebanon billions of dollars in assistance in, in exchange for measurable and demonstrable performance. 
um, in, a, in an article in Foreign Affairs, uh, my colleague and I, Dan Serwer, argue that this body uh, would not only oversee international contribution, but also take responsibility for the use, seeking input from qualified Lebanese civil society group. Such a plan, when it comes to reconstruction funds, would such an authority would, would plan, contract, finance, and supervise the reconstruction process of Beirut, uh, the, the parts that has been uh, destroyed, of its port, and setting the city's rebuilding priorities and choosing its uh, partners. Its staff should consist primarily of politically independent Lebanese specialists known for their integrity and professionalism, while its board should include an inter international majority approved by the donor states. All reconstruction donors would need to operate through this authority rather than through local government agencies as donors have done in the past. This is one, one opportunity for the international donor community, including the World Bank, to engage in the kind of long, medium-term approach uh, that tries to build state capacity through engaging with uh, civil society organization, uh, engaging with civil society, uh, with, with experts, uh, uh, that uh, that have that are known for their uh, for uh, for their integrity and that have legitimacy and credibility uh, with the wider uh, public. Uh, and the final point I would like to make is about uh, the case that you make for um, economic cooperation. And I think you make a very strong cage for regional cooperation frameworks and the benefits that can accrue from them for the three countries mentioned in the report, but also for the region uh, writ large. Uh, as you will say, as you well said, Haroon, uh, there have been many attempts to date uh, of regional integration, but also regional cooperation. And these attempts have either failed totally or have become stalled due to internal political conflict. Uh, 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 and, and I think well, the primary reason for their failure, which needs to be addressed in, in, in going forward with the recommendation of a regional cooperation framework, per, uh, per as, as the report says, is what uh, my colleague at MEI, Ross Harrison, argues in a book which he co-edited with Paul Salem, titled From Chaos to Cooperation Toward the Regional Order in the Middle East. I'm quoting here, the idea of interconnectedness through common interest has little purchase in the Middle East today, end of quote, primarily due to the fact that the governments which suffer from political capital deficits have the tendency to focus more on short-term domestic interest and, 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 and bypass or neglect or are not interested in longer term regional common interests, especially if the latter mean upending a political economy, which is structured to safeguard the interest of few political business elite. Now, the report argues that to adopt a regional focus will necessitate a concerted international effort. In this case, you could imagine putting together a Mashrik international support group, for example. And I think it is one way, you know, to, to, to create that interest, to change incentive structure. But it's also not the only way. Uh, publics, increasingly publics in these countries, have an important role to play in changing elites' incentive structure, and especially youth. I mean, an argument can easily be made to the youth, and the youth will easily understand how scale economies in energy, transport, information, and communication technology help them and advance their future. So going forward, you know, uh, communication strategies, making the case to the youth about the benefits of a regional medium term strategy should be part of this new approach, which the report calls for. I will end at this point. Thank you. Fonda, thanks so very much uh, for those creative uh, and thoughtful insights. So what I'd like to do is um, offer both Saroj and Haroon the opportunity to respond to our two discussants. Um, I wanna throw a question on top of it, which um, in some ways encapsulates uh, where we are, because I wanna start with where we are. Uh, and then I also wanna remind the audience, we are getting some questions rolling in. Please feel free to ask your questions as well using the USIP chat box. Uh, what I'd like to add to what you've heard from Natasha, uh, Natasha and Rhonda, uh, Saroj and Harun, is can you, uh, I think Saroj, you, you, you quite rightly noted that, that the, the region is in a perfect storm. 
Uh, and in particular, I think the challenges from COVID as well as um, financial meltdown in Lebanon and broader financial difficulties in, in Iraq and Jordan really underscore the significant challenges the region faces. But I think as we're hearing from both our discussants, uh, in, inside, inside challenge lies opportunity. And so I'm wondering if, if both of you could respond to, to what Natasha and Rhonda have said and also address a bit more directly uh, the pandemic and some of the subsequent crises that have taken place, I think since the report has been written and, and offer your thoughts, not only on the challenges, but what are the opportunities that are there? And let's start with uh, Saroj and, and then go to Haroon. Thank you very much. And I want to begin by thanking uh, Natasha and Rhonda for their excellent comments and, uh, and also putting forward some uh, very good ideas, which I would like to work with. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the, when, when, when you are in a perfect storm, uh, often the challenge is where to begin, because there are just too many issues to deal with. And this is the situation in Iraq. This is very much the case in uh, Lebanon. I think Jordan is, an, in a way, I think it is a much better position. So I think our approach here has been essentially not just the World Bank, but also working more broadly with the international community in trying to work, let's say, in Iraq with the new government to work on a reform program, a multi-year reform program, which is looking at three broad issues, good governance, building human capital, and improving service delivery. Because these, these three broad issues essentially touch uh, the Iraqi youth and the increasing poverty, unemployment challenges, uh, lack of access to basic services, and, uh, and of course, need for more transparency and accountability in the state institutions. So the idea is to put forward uh, a common uh, program of reforms led by the government and strongly supported by the international community in a way that is there is greater degree of accountability. With regard to Lebanon, um, clearly, I think uh, this is a country where uh, uh, very enterprising people, very resourceful diaspora, and I think a lot can be done to really transform this country into a very prosperous country that it used to be many, many years ago. I think the way we have looked at it uh, in the immediate context is to we soon after the August 4 explosion dis disaster in the country, uh, we, we started what is called a rapid damage and needs assessment. Now, normally we would do this in any country after a conflict, after a disaster, we do this kind of needs assessment. But what is unique to this assessment that uh, at least we made an attempt to reach out to all the civil society organizations, private sector, to get their input into the whole needs assessment exercise. We didn't want this to be just done by the international community, the World Bank, the UN, and the EU. And what we presented uh, this as the whole of Lebanon approach, where all Lebanese stakeholders become part of the conversation and they, they kind of, in a way, engage in defining what the immediate and short term needs are. This is work in progress. But what we made it very clear, and this goes uh, exactly along the lines uh, Randa was mentioning, is that for any reform, recovery and reconstruction to happen in Lebanon following the August 4 explosion disaster, the, the, there has to be a process of uh, reform. And without reform, there will be no recovery and reconstruction. And in the RDNA report, we, 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 we present what we call a 3R framework, reform, recovery, and reconstruction framework. And the first R is for reform, it means reform comes before recovery and reconstruction. And there is, a, I would say, a very strong consensus among the international community that the, the, the recovery and reconstruction is an opportunity to advance much needed reforms, particularly in the area of governance. And governance in a very broad sense, more transparency, more accountability, better public institutions, which are accountable to the citizens. And that is what currently we are working with 
in helping build a 3R framework, which can be operationalized to be supported by a financing mechanism that Randa was just alluding to. So there is some thinking ongoing in terms of what that financing mechanism would look like, how we are going to engage uh, civil society in advocacy, but also in the delivery of recovery and reconstruction programs, unlike many other conflicts and disasters where you primarily work through the government agencies. So we are certainly looking at the capacity that exists here among the civil society organizations, which are already doing great work on the ground. So idea is to support them so that they can continue their work. The last thing I would say is which a slight deviation from what Randa was saying is, can we, can we afford to, com to, to completely bypass the state and the state institutions? The, the challenge is that you need a state to facilitate recovery and reconstruction. You need a state to initiate and implement much needed reforms. You need state to, to have a dialogue with all the stakeholders, including the civil society organizations. So I would remain very hopeful that through the ongoing political process and the incoming government would embark on a serious reform that we can be support, we can support and we can help build right institutions which are needed essentially to take many of these ideas forward. Because we do not see an alternative to not having a state I think you need a state, you need a very strong state and you need a state which is, response, which is responding to the needs of its people. And that is what the ongoing political discussions are about. And I think the, the idea of an intra, international reconstruction authority, we, I mean, we're not saying international, but the, the very notion of having a reconstruction authority, which has adequate representation from the civil society, from private sector, independent experts, that is very much is what basically currently being discussed. I also want to close by saying this, this whole, what can the World Bank, let's say, do to promote more dialogue among the countries in the region? And it's been, it's been something which we have taken it as a priority. We had to choose topics on which it is easy to bring countries together. We have currently three platforms where we are working very extensively with the countries in the region. One is on the issues of uh, female labor force participation. It might sound like a, not a very important issue, but for many, but when you talk about economic growth, you realize that, you know, you, the female labor force participation ranges from 15% to 24% in our group of countries. Now, if you, if you have uh, more than half of your uh, people in the country are not engaged in economic space, what kind of growth are we talking about? So therefore, I think more needs to be done to really accelerate the female labor force participation in terms of social norms, legislative changes and economic space. So there is a platform, Maastricht gender platform, which brings all these countries together. We're doing something similar on Maastricht Digital Forum, which brings all these countries together to look at more digital payments, cross-border infra digital infrastructure, et cetera. And the third is on water. I mean, water has been essentially uh, a very contentious issue in the region, but we have initiated what is called the Maastricht Transboundary Initiative, which looks at countries in the Euphrates and the Tigris water river basin to come together and to have a dialogue on this issue. So more could be done. And I think I like the idea that Randa put on the table to build a political kind of consensus and support for such initiatives through the Maastricht international support group. That's something I think we should follow up. Uh, it's, it's a great idea, I think, from coming from uh, Rhonda. I'll stop here, uh, Mona. Thanks so much, Saroj. Uh, Harun, I want to turn to you and give you an opportunity to, to respond as well. And I think also to touch on this question that Saroj has raised about ultimately in Lebanon, you need a, you need a state to work with. Uh, but I do think this issue of, of sequencing and of pushing reforms and that this is a moment, this is potentially a catalytic moment for Lebanon uh, to, to actually engineer real change. So please, Harun, off, let's, let's hear some of your thoughts. Uh, thanks, Mark. This, this is a fascinating discussion and comments from our, our, our commentators. Um, can we focus on structural issues while constantly firefighting? So this is against the, the kind of common conventions, that's that's obvious. 
uh, when you look at, for example, the regional integration theory and, and applications elsewhere, for example, the European Union, take that one. Um, the sequence is usually first these countries converge and they create the, the structural conditions for such regional framework and then they undertake, for example, their business cycles need to be synchronized and there should be other conditions that can facilitate a, a kind of successful regional framework. But the, the problem in the Maastricht region is, is slightly different. The question that we are asking is that, look, we, we are in a really, as Saroj mentioned, we are in a really perfect storm situation. And we have been for a while. And it, it rather now looks like the, this is the norm for the region rather than an exception. So there's always an emergency in, in the Maastricht region. And that comes in our work as well. When you work in Maastricht, you're always firefighting. And, and Natasha also mentioned that one. Um, the, the question that we are trying to answer is that, OK, we know that such convergence, such uh, like smooth transition is not happening. That, and in the past, we looked at the regional integration frameworks. They, they didn't work because such conditions were not there. But the question we are trying to ask is that, can such a framework be the incentive for such conversion? So we take, take it upside down. We say that, OK, we know that the conditions do not lead to convergence. But the promise of convergence, if there is sufficient international support and if there is suffi sufficient local support for that, can that be an incentive to stabilize and promote economic prosperity in the region? And in this report, we are taking an optimistic view. We think that there are certain conditions right now that can facilitate that. And the, the presence of refugees is one. And many transboundary issues, as Saroj mentioned, we have, we have water, we have the migration, we have many transboundary issues. Really, it is, it is, very, it is more difficult to stabilize one country in an, in an ocean of instability than try to stabilize the ocean itself. So we have that problem. And Rhonda mentioned that uh, is, is the international framework, a, a broad international support for such a regional perspective, and the, the public, a bottom-up approach, are these things uh, one way or another? In, in my view, these things are the same, it's the same, the dif different part of the same coin. Uh, without such a public uh, framework, the international uh, and engagement will, 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 will fail. It's doomed to fail. But we have that public interest right now, I believe. Based on my discussions with civil society organizations, my colleagues who work on the field in the region, the public has already a mind of regional perspective. With, with technology, with communications becoming easier, I think um, it is becoming more and more difficult for the people of the region to consider themselves contained within a single country world where the the, the state in this uh, country is a, is a balance between the ruling powers and, and, and uh, points of interest. And the, the borders are artificially hardened to prevent a regional engagement so that the private interests can be maintained. What happens in Lebanon, what happens in other countries show that the public is, is no longer accept, accepting such a really low equilibrium. I think. I think we, we gradually uh, have these conditions. Uh, the question is whether can such an international mass be put behind uh, a project that could uh, stabilize the region going forward. Obviously, it is, it is difficult, very difficult. And anybody who says it's going to happen next week uh, either doesn't know or is a dreamer. Uh, but uh, I think the, the question is, what is the alternative, really? What is the alternative in this region? So what else can be done? That I think it, we don't have many options for you. Thanks, Harun. So believe it or not, we're getting close toward the end of our session. What I'd like to do is put out uh, a couple of the questions that have come in from the chat. And I'd ask each of our uh, participants to please be brief in your response. One has to do with the withdrawal of the US from the region and what impact that will have as, as a key stakeholder, as a key player. The other has to do, again, with this question of uh, very slow going reform while people are suffering, whether it be in Syria, for sure, in Lebanon now as well, in Iraq, too. Um, 
So is there a different way? Is there a parallel track that can, that can address some of these humanitarian needs, reconstruction needs in the face of slow recovery? I'm gonna throw one more on there and I'd ask each of you to just pick one and respond briefly. And that is about a key, a key point I think I wanna highlight from the report, which is it really does bust an important myth to use Rhonda's term with respect to refugees and the role they play. And the fact that in, with inclusive policies, not only have they generated an increase in GDP, but they could generate even more. And I'm wondering if, if uh, any of the panels would like to, to tackle how to move forward on more inclusive policies for refugees. So why don't we go very briefly, very briefly in, in reverse order. I'm gonna start with you, Rhonda, and then we'll go to Natasha, Haroon, and then Saroj will let you conclude. Rhonda, I think you're muted. Is Am I on now? You're on. Okay. So um, very briefly in terms of withdrawal of the US uh, from the region, uh, I think it's already factored in into many of the calculi of regional leaders. And uh, uh, and I'm not going to see, uh, I, I uh, the problem is, I mean, I don't think we have a military withdrawal. I mean, we have forces throughout the region. Uh, in Northeast Syria, they are there. In Iraq, uh, definitely, I think, whatever the next administration is going to be, we're going to have more pressure for these forces uh, to withdraw. Um, and so, uh, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that there is a an economic withdrawal, if we can put it this way, or or decreased uh, interest or popular support for assistance uh, to refugees to help countries hosting refugees uh, increase their state capacity and uh, resilience. So I think this whole issue of withdrawal of the U.S. while at the political level it matters to the to the to the leaders and it matters to the public perceptions maybe, but uh, in terms of operationally what it means to U.S. role. In, in leading humanitarian effort, assistance efforts to refugees, uh, in leading uh, 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 talk and push for reforms through multilateral organizations like the World Bank, I don't think that's going to disappear anytime soon. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, very, very briefly, Natasha, like a minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, just really briefly, uh, the two first points, because they're interconnected. I actually do think that the US is pivoting away from the Middle East, and this is because of primarily because of energy security. And I think what we have to be careful of is that with our absence comes other people filling the gaps, and that could be the likes of, of Russia and China, as we have seen. And that has a big impact on the reform aspect, which was the other question, how can we do slow moving reform while people are suffering? Well, I would argue that people are suffering without the reform, and we've seen uh, we've seen that in Syria, and we've seen that in Lebanon and Iraq, most certainly. Um, so we need to really, or as the U.S., we need to be quite strategic uh, in how we sort of try to fill the gaps so that others do not, uh, in a way that sort of exacerbates this type of suffering. Thank you, Arun. Very very briefly. Yes, on the second point, I would like to talk about uh, in, in the report, we do not really uh, propose to just focus on the structural issues and ignore the firefighting in the short term. We we have two layers of recommendations. One is the unilateral. These things can be done regardless of what happens in the region, whether you have a regional framework or you don't have a regional framework, whether the neighboring country uh, deteriorates or not. So these are the unilateral policies and we identified, as I mentioned, three areas. One was the social safety nets. This is exactly what the, the question is referring to. People are suffering. So we need to reinforce our social safety nets in these countries drastically. Uh, the other one is public provision of services, both to refugees and, and the host community members. This needs to be improved drastically. And then state capacity. To be able to do the first two, you need to build on the state capacity in these countries. And these can be done regardless of what happens in the medium term or in the long term. There is scope to do it within the current political economy framework, and we need to push for that. Thank you so much, Harun. Saroj, I'm going to give you the last word. Oh, thank you, Mona, again. Uh, three points I want to make. First, I think uh, uh, we, we have seen uh, people on the street and expressing their frustration with the state 
and, and their capacity to provide services, being ensuring transparency and accountability in the governance. And my reading is that these are going to continue unless there is a fundamental change in governance and ensuring basic services and what the real role that state is supposed to perform. I think we will continue to see these protests on the street. As long as they are on the table and they are not withdrawing, I think the pressure will be maintained. I'm not answering the question you asked. I'm answering in a way where I see people from these countries engaging and demanding good governance. And they are on the table now and they will stay there. I don't see them withdrawing anytime soon. Iraq, Lebanon, we've seen this happening for quite some time now, which I think is a good sign. The protest should remain peaceful, but I think it's very important that the people have organized themselves and they have started to speak. The second is on the reforms uh, and the pace of reforms and the needs of the people. Yes, most of the reforms which are needed in these countries, they will take time to show results. The reforms, there's always a lag in terms of when you initiate a change, you create a better business environment, private investments come in, by the time projects are done, jobs are created, new opportunities are created, it takes time. And this is why we always advocate for a multi-year reform program, where you start addressing some of the structural issues, but you make sure, as what Harun was saying, that you have a comprehensive social safety net program. More broadly, you have a national social protection system in place, Plus, you also have a system to ensure certain delivery of basic services. So I think all this would need to form as part of a national program to be able to take these reforms forward. But it has to begin someday. The challenge is that we haven't seen actually countries really coming with a strong political commitment and engaging with the civil society, people at large, and embarking on a reform program. Remember, this is the compact. If the countries come forward with a strong reform program, a lot of that bilateral and multilateral support which is on the table for these countries, it could become part of that program. It's a compact. If the countries are willing to change, I think there are development partners, multilateral institutions who are willing to provide technical and financial support to help implement these reforms. But the countries must take the, the ownership and define that program going forward. Last point on the question that came on the refugees. I agree. I think it is important that the nationals, the countries have a more inclusive strategy for supporting what I would call vulnerable people. Refugees by their very nature are very vulnerable. And therefore, I think as much as you look at the poor and vulnerable in the host communities, the displaced population and the refugees also need to be part of this. And we are ready to support along with the other donors in helping governments provide protection and developing opportunities both to the host communities as well as the refugees. Thank you and back to you, Mona. Thank you so much. Let me thank our panel for a fantastic discussion. I commend to everyone the latest report from the World Bank, the third in the Syria trilogy. It's a powerful report. It documents well the challenges, but it ends on a very hopeful and creative note. Thank you all so much for joining us. Everyone stay safe and we hope to see you again soon.